Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for uh, coming out on a very chilly Michigan evening. I guess you wanted to hear about Saudi Arabia tonight. This would be a fine time to do that on a cold night. Thank you for coming. I'm Michael Vendetta, and I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. On behalf of Emily Smith and Erica Kubik, my colleagues, we're really glad you're here. This is the third session of a four-part series on the Arabian Peninsula. And we have had uh, just a delight so far. I don't know how many of you were here for one of the first two sessions. Oh, quite a few of you. That's great. We learned about Oman. We learned about Qatar. Tonight, Saudi Arabia. And uh, a week from today, Yemen. And uh, if you've been at the ones before, you'll know that uh, every country has a very, very distinct history. Of course it does. We know that about our own country. And to really understand what's going on in the uh, in uh, the Middle East, you really need to study each country individually and understand where, why they are, why they've developed, how they've developed, and what are some of the issues that turn out of that. So we're, uh, we're delighted that you're back for that. And uh, I want to thank so much our series sponsor, Sound Off Signal from Hudsonville. They've been a great supporter of the World Affairs Council, and they're supporting this particular series. Sound Off's one of 50 local businesses that supports the World Affairs Council and all of our local colleges and universities. And a shout out to Grand Valley State University, uh, where uh, Dr. Alreb comes from, and also the Seedman School for hosting us. We're really grateful for that. Uh, we're hoping to have about 30 or 40 minutes of presentation from our professor, and then we're going to open it up for questions, and he and we are anticipating many of them. Uh, you did a great job in our first two sessions. There were some excellent questions, and we, we uh, expect nothing less from the audience here, here tonight. And also want to look out for Kathy Dopp. Where's Kathy? There she is. Kathy's a member of our council, and as usual, she is going to host uh, a conversation group after tonight's presentation. She does this very often. We appreciate that from Kathy. She'll be at New Holland Brewery. She's got a table reserved. And if you hear things tonight you want to keep talking about, Kathy and other council members will be around the tables uh, continuing the conversation. So thanks to her for that, and we encourage you to do that. So um, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. Abdullah Al-Reb for you. He's an assistant professor of sociology at religion, of religion and sociological theory at Grand Valley State University. He's an academic and author with research interests in the Middle East, Arabic literature, and Islam. He earned a PhD from Michigan State University uh, and also a master's in, from MSU in sociology. And he has a master of Arabic language from King Saud University. He's published a number of academic articles and book chapters focusing on religion, the Middle East, social movements, and education. His major interest is Saudi Arabia and the Islamic mobilization in Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Before coming to Grand Valley, Dr. Alreb was a visiting assistant professor at MSU and a faculty member at Saginaw Valley State University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Abdullah Alreb. Yes. Hello. I know I have a loud voice, so I'm not that rude person, but maybe, yeah. Many people misunderstand me when I start talking. They think I'm rude because I have a loud voice. I, so I don't think I need a mic. OK. Yeah. You think so? <laughs> OK. Thanks for coming tonight. And uh, thank, for, thank you, Mike, Erica, and World Everest Council for this invitation. And I hope I will deliver a good speech. The only challenge I have tonight is uh, time. My parents used to complain about me that I, when I start talking, I don't stop, but I will try to stop on time. <laughs> yeah, Saudi Arabia, the country that uh, occupy 80 percentage of the Arabian Peninsula, and the homeland of Islam, where Mecca and Al Medina, the, that used to be uh, called Jathrib in Bible and uh, Torah. Uh, in west coast of Saudi Arabia, and in the east coast, uh, we have the oil reserve. So people know about Saudi Arabia 
uh, based on those two basic uh, pieces of information. Uh, all Muslims today, when they pray, they uh, stand forward Mecca. In, in the United States, it will be Northeast. So it's a really important country, and we hear a lot about Saudi Arabia in the news and a lot of uh, involvement in the world affairs. Saudi Arabia today is the third version of the ruling of House of Saud. Back to the 18th century when Imam Muhammad bin Saud, and in that time, Imam mean the religious man, and Imam mean the ruler of Muslim society. Imam Muhammad bin Saud, the fifth great grandfather of King Ibn Saud, the founder of uh, Saudi state today, met with Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, the founder of Wahhabi movement, that people know about it as Wahhabism today, met in Adr'iya. Adr'iya was a small town. I think it's in size of Allendale, no more than that in this time. It was the core of Saudi Arabia uh, today. They met and they shared the interest about expanding the role of Saud with uh, Wahhabi uh, lessons and teachings of, of Islam. And Wahhabi, Wahhabism is not a sect, it was a movement, it's a Sunni movement that adapt humbly, which is part of uh, the four, four uh, main schools in Sunni Islam. So they start, establish their, uh, their first state, and years later, in it, early of uh, 19th century, it being collapsed by uh, Ottoman Empire when they give the order to the governor of Egypt, Muhammad Ali Basha, to collapse this country. It's happened, but six years later, they get back. Same families, House of Saud and uh, uh, House of Al Sheikh, Muhammad Abdul Wahab family, reestablished the country again and called Emirat of Najd. Najd is the central part of Saudi Arabia where uh, Saudi stories start. Later, the friends that turned to be enemies are Rashidi's uh, family in Hail, north of Arabia, fought with the House of Saud and won and uh, take over the Arabia, especially the center of Arabia, until early of 20th century when the young son of the last ruler of Emirate of Najd decide to get back of the family glory from their exile in Kuwait. Abdul Aziz bin Abdul Rahman al Faisal ibn Saud, or as people know, know him in the Western Academy as Ibn Saud, he led his group, 60 uh, individuals from Kuwait, their exile in Kuwait, to Riyadh, to get Riyadh by, back, then establish his empire state. We call it empire state in political science because it starts with a small part and expanded. So this is the story of Saudi Arabia that started from small part. He get Riyadh back and then start to get the rest of uh, central of Arabia and move east and west, north and uh, south until he get the rest of part. There are many interesting stories we don't have time to share today, and I will be more than happy to answer any question regarding this part of history. But the most important two pieces of uh, history of expanding state, when he took the eastern part of Arabia, in that time there was no oil. People were not about, uh, were aware of, about oil, but they are aware about the east part uh, on the Gulf as the window to deal with the, the world, in addition, uh, it was rich by agriculture, especially palms and dates. West Bart, when, the, when he fought uh, Hashemiyat family, and uh, that's been ruled by the great grandfather of the current uh, Jordanian king, and he, uh, he took uh, Mecca and Medina, which add more religious legitimacy to this new state. Uh, before declaring the kingdom, uh, his best friend, uh, Ikhwan, uh, mean brother in, uh, in Arabic, and they are different from Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Those people uh, revolt because they want more theocracy compared with the modern state. Ibn Saud was not interested in 
honoring them, so they get in conflict, and he won in 1930. In 1932, he declared the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, so he put all those territories under his last name, so people now being addressed by the House of Saud uh, real uh, family name. We will go through the history of the kings, as usual, what we study in uh, Middle Eastern countries in, uh, in historical curricula. Usually we go by kings. Let me apply this uh, method and uh, we'll see through the history how the country being developed. After the creation of the kingdom, Ibn Saud turned from the fighter who is carrying the sword to be the king who is ruling his modern country. There are three shifting points in his era as a king from uh, 1932 to 1953. The beginning of the modern Saudi state, so in that time, he tried to borrow people from other places, even outside the Avancilla, he got people from Iraq, from Egypt, from Syria, from Lebanon, in addition to some people from Hejaz, the west of Saudi Arabia, and shaped his first government. So basically, the first Saudi government, mostly non-Arabian people. They are Arab, but they are not from Arabia. Until people get more education and take over. Discovering oil in the 30s, and when, Br when British companies give up uh, searching for oil, there was a British guy called John Philip B. convinced Americans to come to find the oil. When they found the oil, it was more than economy. So Ibn Saud met uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, in 1940s, which shift the whole political alliance from Great Britain to United States of America. They met. Uh, President Roosevelt was so smart. He, uh, he learned a lot about Arabic culture before he met uh, King Ibn Saud. There is a really interesting story if you guys uh, read about it, how they greet each other and they start personal relationship, which lead to strong alliance in the future. After Ibn Saud passed away, the problem of succeeding, it's uh, it used to be a serious problem everywhere in the Arabic history, but looks like it was a peaceful way that the oldest son, King Saud, take over. So they start to form the Council of Ministers. And instead of having four ministers during uh, Ibn Saud era, in the last year of, uh, of Ibn Saud era, he shaped the Minister, the Council of Ministers and appoint his son, Prince Saud, as uh, the Prime Minister, and he kept this title, which become a habit that every king in Saudi Arabia become the Prime Minister. Uh, king Saud take advantage of oil, so he found the first university in Saudi Arabia called King Saud University. In that time, uh, it used to be called Riyadh University. Uh, I get two degrees from this uh, largest university in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. In that time, it was really serious, hard time, as leftist uh, movements, people who believe in communism, uh, revolt against uh, monarchies in the Middle East. It sounds exactly like what we see in Arab Spring but in different uh, way as we will carry ideologies of leftist, Marxist uh, things. Uh, many kingdoms being collapsed in Yemen, in Iraq, in Egypt for sure, in Libya, all those monarchies being collapsed. It was challenge to the authority of the kingdom that based its authority on conservative uh, Islam. And Abdel Nasser was not, of Egypt was not in favor with uh, Saudi Arabia as a strong monarchy that has money. In addition, there was a serious rivalry uh, between Prince Saud and the Prince Faisal, uh, King Saud and his brother, the Crown Prince Faisal. And each one has different vision of how to rule the country. And they used to be the most powerful sons 
of Ibn Saud. This rivalry stayed for almost 11 years until it was clear that the house was divided. People who are pro Saud and people who are pro Faisal, people who are pro Faisal, uh, win and decide to say goodbye to the king uh, Saud. And that happened when the third brother, Prince Muhammad, uh, get to the castle and say, thank you, King Saud. We will proclaim a new king, our brother Faisal. He stayed alive for four years. He enjoyed his freedom, traveled everywhere, and he passed away in Athens in Greek later, after four years. Oh, sorry. King Faisal established uh, the contemporary method of how Saudi Arabia should be ruled. So there was long debate about how we can rule Saudi Arabia. They, and he established a new method that we should not go by the eldest one. We should go by who being selected by the family. At this point, the next brother, Muhammad, was not favored by uh, other brothers. So they bring Khalid, the full brother of Muhammad, to be the crown prince of Faisal. This new method saved the country for the rest of the years. We can consider Faisal as the godfather of the foreign avarice. He kept, uh, he was the first uh, minister of uh, foreign uh, avarice, and he kept this position after he became a king until he passed away in 1975 and passed it to his son, who stayed as the minister of uh, foreign avarice, or what you guys call uh, secretary of state, until. He died in 2015. So basically, in Saudi Arabia, we have only three uh, ministers in the whole history. Faisal create another way of facing uh, Nasser of Egypt. Nasser believed in pan-Arabism. Faisal believed in Islamic Ummah, Islamic nation that uh, can bring the identity of Islam rather than the identity of Arab people. Uh, in that time, King Faisal and his lovely wife, uh, Affet Lithnayan, his cousin that had been born and raised in Turkey, and after she came to Turkey, uh, from Turkey to Saudi Arabia, she wanted to, to bring some of the modern things in, uh, she saw in Istanbul. So she convinced him to establish the woman education which was not in favor with the Wahhabi ulama or the Wahhabi uh, clergy in that time, but he started the woman education in that time, which is a progressive step in 60s compared with uh, the neighboring countries, especially with the rule of Islam and the, the really tight uh, interpretation of how women should be treated in that time. People know Faisal mostly here in the United States, and I can tell some people here about his name when he was a king. I can see from faces. By oil embargo, when he challenged United States policies uh, during uh, the war between Egypt and Syria on one side, Israel on the other side. So he declared the oil embargo, which caused a serious problem and raised the gas Bryce, how much the gas in that time? Anybody can tell me? I don't know. I think some people know about this. Yeah? Then it reached a dollar. Am I right? So people were really, really unhappy with that. Yeah. And he was the man of Time magazine in 1973. It was really. Biggest story in that time in media, and not only Faisal, even his minister of oil, Sheikh Mohammed Abdu Yamani. I think people who follow up the news in that time hear this name a lot. Two years later, Faisal was assassinated by his nephew, Faisal bin Musad, 
Faisal, there was a story about that, that Faisal Musaad has a personal issue with King Faisal, that one of his brothers uh, was killed in demonstration against government because of establishing the TV station in Riyadh. So Faisal gave an order to uh, police to shot those demonstrators, and his nephew, Khalid bin Musaad, uh, killed. Later, his full brother, Faisal bin Musaad, decided to kill his uncle that order, shooting against the demonstrator. So, Saudi Arabia st kept its uh, stability. It was peaceful uh, transition to power. King Khalid take over later in the 70s, and it's, it's the first time we see something close to the British uh, model of governing. We have a king who has a glory, but he was not interested in involving in politics, so he assigned most of his uh, duties to his brother, the Crown Prince, King Fahad, in that time, Prince Fahad. In that time, oil generate a lot of money, and government start to invest this money in interior policies and foreign policies. Uh, more than, uh, I don't remember exactly, 30 percentage or 40 percentage being uh, uh, spent in establishing the infrastructures of the country, three universities, the Royal Commission in Jubal and Yambo, two big cities of industries being established, one in the east and in Jubail, east uh, province, and one in Yambo, the west uh, province, and create a lot of jobs and uh, a new sort of economy in Saudi Arabia. More universities, more educational uh, developments, some scholarships in that time. Then, in 1979, the major challenge, the first challenge based on religion against Saudi authority was in 1979, when a group of people decided to hijack or uh, kidnap the Holy Mosque in Mecca for a few days until Saudi authority take uh, the mosque back and arrest uh, those people and execute them in one day. There were 56 uh, individuals who participated in this uh, uh, siege of Mecca and all of them being executed and it's done. So, in that time, was the acting guy is Prince Fahad. So, some people may think what the choice those people should take. Should they become anti-Islamist? Or what should they do? At this point, we should understand this. Those people, group of, small group of people that think uh, about a, a weapon of challenging the royal family, so they take their own way of interpretation Islam. So at this point, Prince Fahad, the, the crown prince at that time, decided to support Islamists and slow down the modernity, so even the Saudi TV at that time reduced uh, the entertainment part of uh, the TV, know a lot of songs. Uh, they try, start to put uh, more people with Al-Hijab in the TV, not only this. It's useful to use those people to serve other things. How? King Fahd, decide to, after he became a king in 1982, decide to support President Reagan in his doctrine against communism. So, in the United States, they consider communism as enemy because communism against capitalism. Let's get those people in Middle East, in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, who were excited to fight the enemies of God, and there is no way of convincing to fight those people other than communists mean 
atheism, they don't believe in God. So all of them being in Afghanistan fighting Soviet Union and they win. So that's what happened in that time. And to enhance uh, the Islamic face of Saudi Arabia, King Fahd decided in 1986 to change the title of King of Saudi Arabia from His Majesty to the custodian of the two holy mosques. And you can guys imagine how modest image he will impose uh, at this point by shifting from majesty to custodian. Uh, it is went just fine until Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1992, which threatened the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf countries. So President Bush sent uh, his troops and many other countries make alliance against Saddam Hussein. They won the war. So what happened in Saudi Arabia? People who come from Afghanistan and believe they are heroes of Islam and uh, even New York Times, Washington Post portray them as heroes. The term jihad and the term mujahideen in 1980s was completely positive and I bet those people who read the news in that time and remember, they, they know it was really positive. So when they get back, they feel shocked how the king let non-Muslims or the term kuffar, infidels, protect Mecca. That's what they think. Even Osama bin Laden himself uh, was shocked. What happened in that time? They challenged Saudi authority, a lot of demonstrations. Saudi government took care of them, arrest uh, those people that we can call them the, the clergy of Sahwa. Uh, and it's done as organized uh, method of challenging the state. However, they start to attack Saudi and American interests everywhere until we reach September 11 in 2001. So all those tensions in 90s based on what's happened in Afghanistan. So how Reagan Dictanin support those people when they're done with Soviet Union they still have energy and they have long experience. That's what happened. Before he, uh, his health uh, get with the problem, especially with his stroke, King Fahd decided to establish the basic law of Saudi Arabia. It's not a constitution, but it's just explain how the Saudi government should run and who has the right to be a king and crown a prince. And in 1995, he suffered from stroke, which make him transferring the power, but keeping the glory. So from 1995, Prince Abdullah, the crown prince, take care of the government as the de facto leader. Then when Abdullah became a king, for the first time, we see the power of division is more clear. Abdullah became a king in the age of 81. And his other brothers, other three brothers, were strong enough and controlling big institutions within the country. So it was collective power ruling the country in that time. Abdullah was interested in modernizing the country but in this age, with sharing power, it was not enough to do all what he wanted, and even the senior brothers. The most major things uh, changed in that time, dealing with post September 11. So at this point, he decided to support education, large scholarship program. I am one of the uh, people who benefit of this uh, program being sent to the United States. 70,000 Saudi individuals being sent in, the, uh, in that time to United States to study, United States and other countries to study uh, whatever they want. Uh, he, and this is the flag of the program. He established KAUS, King Abdullah University of Technology, which is large postgraduate uh, University that hosts 
many foreign scholars and students. And he support uh, some woman rights. He let women to get, uh, this is, by the way, this is the uh, campus in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, this is not uh, in Ann Arbor or so. You see those sweet ladies, they don't wear uh, abaya and yeah. But they cannot do this outside the campus, so. Okay. <laughs> so, after King Abdullah passed away, his uh, crown prince, Salman, become the king and he reformed the whole issues in Saudi Arabia. So the royal family being reformatted, people who are in power from third generation, the grandson of Ibn Saud uh, raised over their uncles, the structure of uh, the government being changed, they merged some ministries, uh, they changed the rules of different governmental devices in that time and he decided to transfer the power to the next generation by appointing his uh, nephew, Prince Mohammed bin Naif, to be uh, the king, the, the crown prince, and later appointing his son, Mohammed bin Salman, the one that you guys see in the news every day today, uh, as the crown prince and the de facto ruler of the country today. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman today uh, has a lot of dreams that he share in uh, media. Uh, he, as, in, as a character, he is problematic uh, in the media. You see a lot of people either supporting him or against him. Uh, he is the sole leader of the country today. Uh, he has many projects. Neom, the big city in North, West Saudi Arabia that has a lot of projects and will cost billions of dollars. He allowed women to drive uh, a few months ago and established for the first time movie theaters in Saudi Arabia. We used to go to Bahrain to watch movies. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, uh, yes, uh, I was fortunate that uh, I live one hour away from Bahrain. So every weekend Saudis, invade Bahrain, <laughs> literally, yeah, we invade Bahrain every, uh, and we change a lot of uh, cultural things uh, in Bahrain. We have a Bahraini friend here, Dr. Qasem Oran, he may talk about it uh, if you guys want. Then, if we think about foreign affairs, he declared the war against uh, uh, the former president, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, and uh, his uh, supporters, Houthi group. Uh, and the war has been for more than three years today. Uh, the conflict of, uh, with Iran become more obvious uh, as the political game between the two major countries uh, start to be more warmer, and they cut the relationship uh, with each other. And Extending the positive relation with the United States and Europe as individual, he, he tried to introduce himself as a modern reformer. So he visited the United States several times and Europe to introduce uh, himself. Uh, his vision 2030 about economy and how Saudi Arabia can transfer from oil to other sorts of economy. And it's uh, a debate if this uh, vision will win or not. So that's what we see in the news all the day. Uh, I hope I cover most of the major trans uh, transitions in Saudi Arabia within the Saudi history within those 30 minutes, which is good. And let's start question and answer and I will cover anything you may ask about. <laughs> Okay, so the professor got us up to the current point and talked about a little bit about some of the many, many issues currently going on. So now's your chance to ask him some questions about, given all this history, 
What's happening now, Kathy? How does the profits from the oil industry get distributed to s citizens of Saudi Arabia? So Saudi Arabia is a renter state. It's not a capitalist, a capitalist state uh, with uh, uh, many productions being owned by um, a private business. It's not a communist or socialist about collective uh, ownership or government ownership. It's been owned by the government 100%. And the government has the right to spend the, uh, the money in the way that they want. So it's up to the government as the renter state. So they spend, at this point, uh, government is responsible about free education, including uh, free higher education, but it's competitive. Uh, free health uh, care and supporting some sort of uh, uh, primary goods. That's what government try to, uh, try to do. In addition, most of people in Saudi Arabia still work for public sector that's been owned by the government. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned 2030, switching the economy from oil to something else. So what, what is that? What is the major plan to switch to? Yeah, we need economists to talk about this more. I'm sociologist by training, but we'll, we'll try to uh, uh, answer this question. According to the declaration of this uh, vision, uh, the current government led by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman tried to uh, create a new sort of business in Saudi Arabia, more in this, uh, more sort of in industrialization other than oil, uh, media, uh, tourism, whatever they want. They try to bring more diversity of business in Saudi Arabia. That's the vision right now. And we are still in 2018. And uh, the vision being declared, I think, in 2016. So they try to bring another sort of business other than oil that control over 90 percentage of the Saudi economy today. What's the education or school system like there? Is there tracking? Are girls educated through high school, through higher education? Is it public? Yeah. In Saudi Arabia, the, in theory, the educational system for both uh, boys and girls, they are separated. Uh, it's almost the same, okay? Uh, until 2003, they used to be led by two different entities, uh, one for boys and one for girls. For the higher education, there, uh, there, was, there was a third one called the Ministry of Higher Education that's been stopped uh, during uh, King Salman era and merged all those institutions together. So girls have better access to education now compared with years ago. So some, uh, some measures, it's hard to find a university accepting girls, especially engineering. So most of female engineers in Saudi Arabia being educated outside Saudi Arabia. Now they open more and more uh, opportunities for, uh, wo for women to involve in these uh, measures. The major problem is the, se the segregation of genders in uh, Saudi uh, schools. They still away from each, uh, from each other. So I have never had any colleagues, classmates uh, uh, beside me b other than the kindergarten years ago. So now if, if, you, uh, if you eliminate colleges of medicine, so they have no choice, they, they have to be together, all institutional, uh, educational institutions are separated, with one exception is uh, King Abdullah University, which is, West, uh, which is in Western style and has different, its own rules. Is that the picture you showed? Yeah. Yes. So you spoke about uh, coming to the United States yourself on a scholarship with, when 70,000 students were given scholarships. Excuse me, when you yeah. came to the United States to study on a scholarship and you said 70,000 students received scholarships, were there women among those students? Oh yeah, a lot of them. Mm 
Yeah. Uh, in that time, uh, anyone, especially between 2005 to 2007, anyone want to go to study uh, outside Saudi Arabia, they could uh, do it no matter uh, of, their, uh, of their gender, even the age. Some people in their late 30s could uh, get scholarships and they give some benefits and this is a major uh, thing. They give a benefit for spouses to study if, uh, if an individual award a scholarship, his or her spouse will award it. For example, I came here uh, having uh, a scholarship. They awarded my wife uh, a scholarship. So that's what happened. So that, that's make uh, no excuse for a man uh, if his wife uh, asks him to uh, join her. If he say, OK, why should I leave my job? OK, you will get the scholarship. Not only this, uh, they require guardian with, uh, with girls. So actually, girls cost more than uh, guys. For example, if I want to come here myself, it's fine. But if a girl wants to come here herself, she, she needs to find somebody else to benefit him. So she get a husband or brother or even uncle. I know some people uh, study because of their daughter's uh, award scholarship. Yeah. How much uh, religious training, teaching, indoctrination goes on in the school system in Saudi Arabia for Wahhabism to um, become more embedded into society? Yeah, as you know, in in Middle East, especially uh, with the mandatory of uh, colonialism, religious identity was really important in the whole Middle East because of the foreign, uh, foreign uh, troops. Saudi Arabia has almost no foreign troops in its territories, but it is part of the identity. Uh, in public school, there is a happy uh, religious uh, lessons. So students uh, study at least four hours a week of religion. And when they go, that's in public school. When they go to universities, uh, you require in public education to have uh, eight credits as uh, religious credits as part of uh, general education. So you need to study at least four credits, which usually eight uh, short courses. The current next generation's leadership, he likes to present himself as a modernizer. Now we have movies. Now we have women driving. But on the other hand, the women who pushed for driving are in jail some of them with death sentences. And so I'm curious of your take on him and the potential for his success as a modernizer and what he means by modernizing, because I know he had the big economic forum and he's trying to create new economic opportunity within the kingdom. But as he does that, he also creates new economic power sources within the kingdom that potentially are in conflict with the goals of the, the, the family. Um, so I see some real conflicts there, and I'm curious your take on that. Yeah, there's a conflict. Nobody can deny it. There's a conflict, uh, and uh, the media outside and inside Saudi Arabia play a role, but even those people who call for uh, change, again, nobody likes to give up the power unless if there is uh, a clear price of uh, giving up uh, the power. So it's typical in the Middle East to find uh, these things. Uh, and when people protest against a government, they, they should be uh, with, uh, uh, go with uh, some uh, issues. And as usually I say to my students in class, we should differentiate between two important terms. Uh, right and real. So, in, so as sociologists, we don't deal with, with right things. This is in ethics or ethical uh, classes. In, in, in sociological classes, usually we talk about the reality. So this is the reality. And uh, as an individual, all what I hope is things will be uh, better in the future. 
with uh, this young bloods uh, everywhere. We hope that uh, the country of Saudi Arabia will move to be even better than uh, what it used to be. And again, I may agree with you that Saudi Arabia does not, uh, Saudi royal family does not need uh, any of uh, these things in order to uh, impose its power because it's still the classical uh, belief of uh, of governance is still uh, is still strong so that's my take and we are dealing with the reality uh, going back to his vision for 2030 he wants to diversify Saudi Arabia into different industries and businesses. Uh, does that mean that these businesses and industries will be privately owned or will they be all parts of the government? As far as I see, uh, private sector should be uh, strength in order to convince those uh, big companies to come to Saudi Arabia. And it will be easier for uh, any country in this world to reduce its its hand uh, on the public sector and let uh, more capitalism compare with the rentalism uh, within the economic system in Saudi Arabia. That's what I see by inv inviting a lot of uh, big companies. That mean putting more on uh, private business and even uh, foreigner uh, ownership. The foreigner ownership now become more com and more compared with what we used to have 10 to 20 years ago. Yeah. And nobody, by the way, nobody can escape capitalism. Yeah, nobody can escape. Yeah. You, you cannot escape capitalism, you cannot escape do uh, dollar at all. <laughs> uh, are the. Uh extremist uh, schools still being funded in Pakistan in the Philippines through Saudi Arabian funding? Interesting. I'm not following what's uh, the, the financial support of uh, charity by Saudi government. I know that b they've been reviewed after September 11, uh, but I don't think the problem only with money because uh, Afghan war that's been influenced by Reagan doctrine and Saudi and Egyptian uh, fund by men and uh, teaching uh, is, the, is the primary uh, motivation of uh, the vision that you can see in Afghanistan or Pakistan today. Yes, I think uh, the fund been cut in significant way, but uh, is this the only problem? I think uh, the lessons of teaching uh, anti-Islam uh, enemies that in that time uh, were communist shift to be Americans because uh, and 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 Western uh, things because the discourse of hatred against uh, communist was in that time mobilized as the enemies of, of Islam that time. So after communists become powerless in uh, in 1990s, they start uh, both Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and uh, I'm not talking about individuals, Osama bin Laden or Dawahri or those people. The, the culture, the ideology that we see there in Afghanistan, Afghanistan and even in the countries that those uh, fighters, warriors, uh, come from, they shift to, f to face uh, uh, America and its, uh, its friends, including Saudi uh, government. So yeah, I, I, when I answer it, the, the budget being cut in, but uh, the story is not over because the ideology and mistrust in both parties still, and they still, don't trust each other. If the government funds higher education, is there any expectation or encouragement for citizens to then return to Saudi Arabia after they've achieved their degree? Uh, yes. Uh, it's complicated because 
When people uh, get their scholarship, they have to sign that if the government asks them to come to work, they must come. In reality, the government does not ask because you know, large number of educated people, some of them may have spots and some of them not. Personally, I couldn't find the uh, position because of the bureaucracy of universities there. So I get position here faster than there. So I'm here now. I may get back one day. I don't know. I go to Saudi Arabia uh, every year. And uh, I know s some people decide to stay outside in the United States, Canada, Britain, France, Australia. And some of them uh, take it as temporary positions. They, they will go back whenever they have uh, uh, opportunity, but the, major, the majority of people get back. Yeah. Any other questions for somebody up here? Oh, this lady. Concerning promoting the, the rise of alternatives to the oil industry, would you consider Saudi Arabia to have much of an entrepreneurial culture? Are, are there a lot of small stores that are run by Saudi people? Or are they run by foreign nationals? Uh, um, people starting small businesses? Yeah, a small business uh, with capitalism, they are not in favor, you know. Uh, indeed, a small business used to have stronger power compared with today because, you know, with capitalism, small, uh, smaller businesses start, uh, face hard time to survive. For example, if we walk around, we see Walmart, uh, uh, Meyer, and all those big businesses, it's hard to find a small grocery store. In Saudi Arabia, we used to have a lot of small grocery stores compared with those big uh, supermarkets like what we see uh, with Meyer and Walmart. And w if we apply a grocery business with other business, we can see a uh, small business may face harder time in favor to the uh, big business, big companies and uh, brands. Um, with the Yemen war, which hasn't gone as well as might be hoped, um, and the recent events in Turkey, which certainly caused significant uproar, is MBS's position within the family at all compromised? Um, such that he now has to reach more consensus with other members of the royal family? As far as I know, I don't see uh, any sort of uh, negotiation among the fa family unless if there's something that I'm not aware of. Uh, the war of Yemen is one of the debatable uh, things in the news every day, and I think we will hear more next week with Professor Jamal uh, Ghassim when he talks specifically about uh, the war in Yemen. The w it's unfortunate that uh, we don't have uh, uh, enough peace in the Middle East, and the, all what I hope as somebody from the area that uh, the war will stop and everybody will be happy. It's hard. To, uh, to make everybody happy, but I think it's less harder to, uh, to stop the world. The world. That's what, all what I uh, can tell. In, in terms of uh, compromising, I haven't heard about this uh, in media or in political analyzing, either in Arabic or English sources. Are Arabic sources covering uh, the um, assassination of the Washington Post? I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name correctly. Um, are they handling it? What's the differences the way from how Arabic sources are covering it from how the West is covering it? Oh, it's like uh, the differences of any other issue. <laughs> Actually, indeed, I done my doctoral uh, dissertation in Michigan State University, analyzing the newspapers' stories of covering the authority in Saudi Arabia within 20th century, and those newspaper stories at, that I analyze come from London Times and New York Times. And when I read about them and try to compare them with uh, 
what we see in the news. People have different takes. First of all, uh, media follow its supporter, no matter if it's in Middle East, it's in Korea, it's in uh, in the United States. Each uh, each single media device is an agent to one of the political entity in some way. Okay. Uh, in uh, Arabic media, for example, when they cover the issue of Jamal Khashoggi, the uh, writer that used to write for uh, Washington Post, we have two radical groups. There is nothing in the middle. There, there is almost no gray area. People who are pro Prince Mohammed bin Salman and people who are anti Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, especially after the Qatar crisis, a uh, year and a half ago, Al Jazeera started to support uh, the Qatari regime because part of uh, the problem between Saudi Arabia and Qatar was Al Jazeera. So w we can see some people try to shine the image of Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Some other uh, uh, media devices try to make it there is no doubt Mohammed bin Salman is the one who is behind this. If we try to take the moment and think about it and compare it with the Western media, Western media has almost uh, more reasonable things. At least some of them, they don't have a lot of interest in Middle East. Some of them, yes, they have. So uh, the investigation that's being talked to media is part of the political game uh, that uh, we can see today. Uh, a lot of uh, Western media is based on what Turkish government tried to, to say. Uh, but to answer the, your question about uh, the Arabic media, I see the Arabic media mostly uh, a dream media. So people imagine something and try to convince other people that's what happened. For example, if I go to watch Al Jazeera, uh, or watch Al Arabiya, the arrival, each one of them will say uh, something. One of them say, oh, uh, Al Arabiya will say, President Trump fully support uh, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and he has no doubt that he is away from that. Yes, uh, President Trump has never mentioned that Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman was uh, uh, behind that, but uh, Al Arabiya may sh uh, shape it with more positive way. Al Jazeera, if you watch it, you might think Prince Mohammed bin Salman will leave uh, his position tomorrow. Uh, here's the problem. Uh, in, in Middle East uh, media coverage, you cannot trust, not because we don't have a, a lot of Russian people, because the media being supported by uh, certain uh, group of people that uh, have interest. Same thing here. If you see Washington Post, they have personal things. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi used to write for them. And uh, his friends think if they let it go, uh, they, will not, uh, they will be attacked one day by any other uh, agent. Wash uh, New York Times, they are Democrats. They have problem with Trump, and they solve it through Saudi Arabia. And when we think about Fox News and CNN, we will find uh, the same issue. Uh, as you bring the really interesting uh, topic, uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi issue, let me take a minute and talk about it uh, in different way. Nobody talk about a major player in this uh, issue, Turkish government. Turkish government play a game. Nobody can doubt that. They try to pass some rumors. We, we call them rumors because we cannot say if they, they are right or wrong. Yes, some of them start as rumors and become facts that this guy get to his consulate and being murdered. Uh, but when Saudi government say, okay, he been murdered by a group of people without an order, uh, then they start to say, we have videos, we have uh, tapes, where are they? If you say, I pass uh, into some intelligence devices, Fine, but as uh, public people, uh, how can we believe uh, in those intelligence uh, agencies, no matter if they are in the United States, in Britain, in France, in Saudi Arabia, in Turkey, if there is something we should believe, something we see uh, or hear by ourselves. Uh, 
what make me concerned as person is how Turkish uh, government play uh, the game and how they claim more than what they have. Otherwise, uh, why they don't just uh, solve the problem? I think because it's intelligence game and uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, issue will stay puzzle forever if we solve uh, uh, Kennedy assassination, we will be able to solve Jamal Khashoggi assassination. And I'm 41 years old, and maybe after uh, 20 years, when I become 61, I may meet you guys in one uh, place, and we will talk about uh, the, this puzzle. Yeah, I, I think I think the issue has been done, most of it, and if there is any details. Uh, they will remind uh, as puzzle because it's media game and we cannot claim that this uh, person as uh, individual was responsible about uh, uh, this issue because uh, people who defend him may have a lot of good reasons. So again, it's hard to believe. Uh, since uh, 1960s, or even before that, uh, there was the domestic uh, balance of power in Saudi Arabia is based on the alliance between three groups, the royal family, uh, the religious establishment, and the intelligentsia, those who are highly educated in the West. And uh, so that balance of power maintained for a long time. Uh, what do you think about, you know, to what extent uh, the current situation with the growing power of Mohammed bin Salman with the weakening of the religious establishment in Saudi through these reforms and uh, uh, with uh, almost abolishing of the religious police in Saudi Arabia, and also with uh, uh, high, high unemployment among youth and others, you know, uh, to what extent the current situation uh, as a result of the policies adopted, weakening that coalition or that balance of power that used to be uh, uh, ruling Saudi Arabia for, for, for decades? Yeah, uh, for a long time, Saudi Arabia been ruled by uh, the royal family, and uh, having powerful person was not a, a serious problem uh, to, in Saudi Arabia. It's, uh, it's about the policy of uh, this individual. If uh, I think the challenge that face any ruler of Saudi Arabia, regardless if we think about King Salman today or his son, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, or any other individual who is in the position is how to make Saudi people happy and how to make the alliance of Saudi Arabia happy. Uh, for the decline of religious authority in Saudi Arabia, I can think it's normal uh, with all the mass media, the communication, uh, people start to learn about uh, uh, other sort of uh, of Islam, Islamic life. Uh, so women still can wear uh, hijab, but they, uh, they can involve in, in the life more with this huge number of people who used to study in uh, study abroad. Uh, if we say 70,000, I think at least 50 something thousand get back to Saudi Arabia. So uh, the classic uh, religious uh, face of Saudi Arabia uh, will be changed anyway with uh, the current rulers, or uh, even if we change names, uh, the challenge of making the indigenous people in Saudi Arabia happy and the alliance uh, uh, or the partners, United States, France, uh, uh, Britain, and other and U European Union, happy is the major challenge. Yeah. Abdullah, we heard that we heard a couple weeks ago that the uh, um, embargo on Qatar was not being very successful, and that Qatar had figured out a lot of ways to uh, get around that. Um, and then there was some question about how is that all going to end if it's not been successful. How do you think that? Uh, how do you think that uh, is going to end? Um, is, is Saudi Arabia going to uh, just uh, pull back from that, or is there going to be some settlement? Or how do you think that's going to all end? 
It's uh, hard to tell the exact scenario that would happen, but I think the problem will, will be solved anyway. Uh, there was a positive uh, message being delivered by Crown Prince uh, 10 days ago or so when he, when he prized the Qatar economic system. He talked about he, he talked in positive way about uh, uh, the Middle Eastern economy and he included Qatar. Uh, this is a positive sign from Saudi Arabia. Uh, from Qatari side, I don't know what uh, would happen. Uh, Qatar established uh, uh, more advanced uh, relationship with Iran and Turkey. The two major non-Arabic Islamic uh, countries. So I think in the near future, they will solve the problem. Uh, how? I think uh, they will have a major interest ma bringing them back together. And there is always a, uh, a major interest uh, will bring neighboring country together. But when? They may need a year or so. So, in 1982, which is a while ago, uh, I lived in Kuwait, and the only news source we had, uh, the, the nightly news, was a 15-minute broadcast, 10 minutes of which was uh, video footage of who the king was meeting, lots of people showing up at airports. Um, the, the invasion of Kuwait by uh, Iraq uh, changed news sources in that part of the world. All of a sudden, um, all the villas grew uh, satellite dishes pointed at CNN because they were worried for their own safety, understandably so. But that clearly, what I'd like you to address is the changed relationship, access to a broader media base has meant for Saudi citizens as they view and judge whatever judging they're allowed to do, um, the, the rule of the family. Media, I, I agree with you, media before and after uh, 1990, they are completely different. Uh, people who was fortunate to know English in that time, uh, they start to watch CNN and Bahrain uh, television host uh, C uh, CNN and people who watch CNN. I remember uh, b some friends who, uh, of my dad who uh, work in Aramco when they visit my dad and they say, oh, I hear in CNN, blah, blah. This is not what we hear in TV. Not only Saudi TV because I live in East Coast, so uh, we can see TV from UAA, from Qatar, or uh, from Kuwait. Even Iran uh, broadcast and reach uh, Saudi Arabia, and at that time uh, they have their Arabic programs. So we see all those things, but they are different from what we hear in uh, uh, CNN. Five years later, Al Jazeera being established. Uh, which make a motivation to other countries to establish their own uh, uh, TVs, but non-governmental uh, TVs. So Al Alam, the Arabic TV from Iran, uh, Al Arabiya, the, uh, the TV that's been funded by both Saudi Arabia and UAA, uh, and other uh, TVs change people's mind. We have a lot of non-governmental TVs. Yes, we get rid of most of those news that his Majesty uh, received this uh, person, His Majesty travel, but still, His Majesty, and again, all the majesties in the Middle East, either kings, emirs, sultans, presidents, uh, uh, their news is everywhere, but without these protocols. Yeah. Time for one more. Does anybody have a, one more question? No, let's thank Dr. Alreb for uh, leading us today. Thank you. How was it? Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. If you'd like to ask a question uh, of him yet, uh, you're welcome to do that. Join us one week from tonight when we talk about Yemen. And uh, Dr. Yamal Ghassim is here, going to be here with us. He's here tonight, but he'll be where, with us again uh, tomorrow, uh, next Tuesday, I'm sorry. And we'll complete our series. Remember that Kathy will be at uh, the New Holland Brewery. 
And uh, please check our website out, worldmichigan.org. We have the great decisions topics and most of the speakers up on our website. And we've got some flyers outside about that, too, that comes in uh, February and March. Thanks for coming tonight.